frozen fingers and one second line handling. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> When the Mistral wind blows, you can get two meter waves in the river. We give up for today. I feel like I'm walking around with a sword. Where's your horse? I don't know. I'm Maya, and this is Aladino. In mid-November, we converted our 28-foot sailboat into a riverboat, and we started going north, from the Mediterranean all the way to the North Sea. In front of us, we had 2,000 kilometers, 200 locks, an upstream current, and the onset of winter. Join us as we navigate the inland waterways during off-season. This is North Through the Continent. We're going north through the continent. Day three, it's about 7.20 in the morning. We're just getting ready to leave the lock and continue upstream. Uh, the current still looks pretty good and I'm hoping it's gonna continue to be pretty good from now on. And uh, hopefully the currents of yesterday are now behind us. Frozen fingers, one second line handling. Yeah, it's really cold. It is. Morning. There's a little bit of wind, so we'll see if we see something with the spray hood up. It gives some protection. Also, that's why I'm wearing the full weather gear. It keeps the heat trapped in a little more. Yeah. That really helps. Prevents the wind from whistling through your clothes. And the hot coffee, of course. Yeah, yeah I'll grab you that in a second. So we are trying to be tough northerners a little bit. We do have the diesel heater in the boat, but we're trying to just not have it on at night and kind of get used to the temperatures a little bit because, I mean, it's not going below freezing at night. It's around like one to two degrees. So it's very close to freezing, but it's not actually ice. Uh, and we've got a good down blanket on the bed. So we're staying warm that way. It's really cold now, and when all we're doing is standing outside, motionless, it can become quite unpleasant. I'm spending my time off watch by reading or writing inside, but at least it's still sunny and we're making good speed. There's only about one to two knots of current against us, and we expect to make it to the Lock of Bolen today, apparently one of the largest locks in the world. To complicate our journey a little bit, today and tomorrow this biting cold wind is expected to pick up. It even has a name, the Mistral, a violent wind from the north that howls down the Rhone Valley. Apparently when it really gets going, it's capable of kicking up two meter waves in the river. So we are passing a castle on this side and also a town and a ruined castle on this side. and. Um, my guidebook says that this town, it has this kind of, yeah, kind of like a dock where you can tie up if you want to. But this stretch of the river is really open and when the Mistral wind blows, according to the guidebook, you can get two meter waves in the river. And apparently during one really violent storm in 1994, there were six pleasure craft overnighting here and they got caught in these two meter waves and extensive damages and a few of them sank. Which is crazy, it's so hard to imagine two meter waves in a river, that's really significant. Um, but apparently it happens. And uh -oh. got a shelter from Mistral tomorrow. Yeah, so, <laughs> so there is Mistral coming tomorrow, so I guess we should be somewhere safe. We'll figure that out, yeah.
We are arriving at the third lock of our journey so far. It's called uh, Eccles de Cadrus, I guess. But we have less luck because we have to wait at a pontoon. There is a commercial boat coming down. So I guess we'll just have to uh, be patient a little bit and then continue. The wind is definitely picking up here. But nothing to be concerned quite yet. When the lock was ready, we continued upstream. I wish there was more to tell you, but really this section of river was quite uneventful. Industrial buildings and commercial barges characterized the scenery. I made a hot lunch to try and warm us up as the chilling wind kept getting stronger and stronger. Soon enough, we arrived at the Ecluse de Bolen, our final lock of the day. We're just waiting for this lock to be prepared for us. And uh, it's a lock with quite an interesting architecture. Have a look. So this lock was built in the 1950s, so it's got a bit of an outdated architectural style, just a lot of concrete, but it was built to actually be a bit fancy because it was once believed to be the tallest lock in the world. So it has a drop of up to 26 meters, depending on water levels. It, I think it's usually around 23 meters. Um, but now there's a lock in Portugal, which is a little bit bigger, and just even more recently one in China, which is even bigger still. But nonetheless, it's an extremely impressive lock, and it's just quite amazing to travel that amount of vertical distance on a sailboat. When the lights turned green, we cast off from the pontoon and motored into a Clues de Bolen's cavernous depths. <laughs> okay, I guess so. <laughs> Feels like levitating <laughs> on a magic carpet. <laughs> Such a bizarre feeling to just feel yourself going up. It's like you're in an elevator and it's just that slight feeling of upwards motion. Nothing crazy, but you know you're going up and to be standing on the decks of a sailboat while that's happening takes some getting used to. We made it! Feels Holy like we emerged out of a dark cave. We have. Back into the kind of sunlight. Evening is coming pretty fast now. Fully levitated. Fully levitated! Like the bread in the pantry. <laughs> Interesting analogy. Sunset is quickly approaching, it's time for us to find a dock and there aren't any docks for quite a while upriver so we're gonna take the dock right by the Ecluse again so just up here uh, Not the most romantic place to spend the night on one side is a nuclear power plant and on the other side is a highway but uh, we don't have much of another choice so we'll just stay in the boat I guess, be cozy maybe we'll go for a walk just to get a full idea of the scope of the land around here and there is home for the night! Mistral's blowing, hey? One thing about this adventure certainly reminds me of my early adventures on bicycle and it is that you live by the daylight 
So even if it was 4 p.m. before the lock, we would have had one more hour of daylight, but the lock took its time and in one hour we don't get very far, so we have to stay here. And that's actually very similar to when I had my cycling trips, where at 4 I start getting nervous and have to look for a place to start camp and then, uh, yeah, continue the journey as the sun comes up. Here we are, home for the night, and Aladino actually just told me that there is indeed a town nearby within walking distance, so we're gonna go walk over and see what it's all about. Um, yeah, what does the town look like? Is it more of I a... I have no idea. No? No. We'll find out. We were just thinking about all of the progress that we've made because we've been spending all day pushing onwards towards the north, getting up really early, finishing our day right at uh, right when the sun goes down. So we're thinking about how far we've come. We're averaging 40 kilometers a day, which uh, a car traveling a very average speed could do in about half an hour. Well, we're expending all our energy I and diesel yeah. and <laughs> I city in the cold. 140 on a bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we're not going quickly, but we are going. And uh, we're bringing our entire house with us. So that's one benefit. The town of Bolen turns out to be old and charismatic, but at 6 p.m. on a Monday night, it was lifeless. This statue in the main square seemed to sum up the activities available in Bolen. Nonetheless, we walked around a little bit before returning to Magic Carpet. We turned on the heater and were gloriously warm for the first time that day. By now, certainly an evening routine is kind of showing up. We always switch between cooking. Sometimes it's me, sometimes Maya, but what is always true is that Maya always reads and does some research for the narration of course and the storing storytelling side me instead I also do research but I look at navionics I look at uh, distances to be made tomorrow I look at weather forecasts because that makes a big difference and I also look at wind finder because also the wind restricts us in um, how many kilometers we can do and I also look at Google Earth that is actually really handy because you have very little information about docks we just know that there are docks just um, in front of a lock but besides that, there is a few towns with campgrounds and docks, which are marked on Navionics, but it's always one concern and one part of the planning. One other thing is I prepare a big thermos of tea every evening. So we have one hot thermos during the day. And also just after pulling onto the dock, I fill up diesel. So we always start off with 20 liters of fresh diesel in the in the tank. We turn on the heater usually for an hour or two unless uh, cooking gives enough heat uh, so we go snuggle into bed a little warmer but turn it off during the night and then start all over again at 7 in the morning. Time to get up honey. Yes I will. Only two more days before we can maybe rest. You can do it. Oh, really rough night last night. Uh, it was just really loud in the boat and I did not sleep very well. I had a few nightmares. This is the noise that we heard all night. Um, but now we're getting ready to leave again. We're hoping to do another 40 kilometers today and Hopefully, if we're able to do 40 kilometers against the Mistral, which is predicted, the high winds, then we will get to a place with a harbor, maybe even a place to plug in so we can have warm electric heat all night, and that would be fantastic. But we'll see when we get there.
and the mistral is cold. Yeah, there's a little wave, sometimes spray in my face. Um, yeah, it's a little, yeah, new, new challenge again. And we are getting tired, it was hard to get out of bed, but we have to keep pushing. The lovely warm breeze combined with the beautiful scenery made for a fantastic morning cruise. However, we did eventually pass into a more interesting section of river. The Donzier Gorge is a well-known section famous for its steep cliffs framing the riverbank. It was only early afternoon, but we were ready to call it a day. We were tired and cold, and the wind was slowing us down. We give up for today. Uh, there is a town here and we've been here before on our way down. It's uh, not fun against the Mistral and the next stretch is too long to continue. So we decided to stay here. There is a dock. Let's, we'll see what other facilities. And uh, maybe tomorrow is one last day before rain that we can still proceed. But for today it was 12 nautical miles in 4 hours. My guidebook says that the harbor of Vivier is usually completely full with pleasure craft, but now we were the only ones here. The harbor is closed actually for the winter, so no, har so no electricity, no water, and actually not as many pontoons as usual either. Usually there's pontoons kind of sticking out that you can tie to. The town of Vivier with its impressive Gothic cathedral sits on a slight hill. We approached along a tree-lined street, a magical entrance to this storybook town. As we entered, there were two overwhelming impressions. First, of its incredible age, and second, of its ghostly emptiness. Friend! No friend. Although I'm sure Vivier is bustling with tourists in the summer, now, in the cold November winds, the streets were deserted. At times we could see lights shining from behind ancient window frames, but often the shutters were closed. I don't think a video could really describe the feeling of this place. The old walls and narrow streets were straight from a book of fairy tales. All we could hear was the sound of dry leaves echoing between houses as the wind swept them along. It looks so old. I feel like I'm walking around with a sword. Where's your horse? I don't know. At least we came by the river. I feel like that's a fairly traditional way of doing it. Yeah. Imagine that you live in the medieval period, in a small town whose stone walls huddle together tightly. Now, step into Vivier, and the two experiences are not unlike. This is a place where doors lead to nowhere, stairs climb up to impassable stone walls, and workmen replace red roof tiles in the same cold wind that blew when these tiles were first installed. Each wall has been changed by the whims of history, until every window frame could tell a tale far too complex for a quick glance to comprehend. A good book requires the reader to read below and between the words, and the town of Vivier asks the visitor to read below and between its walls to really understand the story. But even at first glance, one thing is very obvious. Vivier is old, and when you walk through its streets, you can't help but feel like you've gone back in time to a sweeter, slower place. Finding gems like Vivier makes me forget about the uncomfortable, cold, windy parts of this journey. It makes me want to embrace all that type 2 fun and see the freezing nights and early mornings as all part of the plot. They're the conflict, the drama, before the resolution of another beautiful town. Actually, it's interesting how this whole river journey is playing out. A river is such a linear thing. You go up or you go down. Your destinations are always predetermined, and in a way, that makes for a great story. Begin here go there, encounter conflicts along the way. It's been interesting to fit my life into a story, not just for the sake of these videos, but for the sake of my own sense of adventure. When you start to see the tough times as simply a conflict in an overall beautiful narrative, it puts a lot into perspective. I'm excited for everything else this river will throw at us, and I'm excited to keep writing more stories with every passing day. 
Join us in the next episode for Misty Mornings and finally, A Harbor with Electricity. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this series and you aren't yet subscribed, then go ahead, press the subscription button, and then press that little notification bell next to it so that you get instant notifications as soon as a new video is published. And an extra thank you to our patrons for making this series possible. Uh, we really wouldn't be out here doing this and with all this great new camera equipment that we've acquired without your support. So huge thank you to all of you. And an extra big thank you to these folks who really go the extra mile to make sure that these videos keep being produced and keep being produced in the best way possible. So thank you to all of you. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, there's a link in the description as always. Thank you all so much.